let's talk about peace and destruction. So, peace sounds like a good idea to everyone. And it sounds like, starting this off, it sounds like I'm making an argument against peace. But, <laughs> bear with me. Because that's what it sounded like to me after I said that. <laughs> um, peace sounds good to everyone. But everybody wants their own peace, don't they? They want peace with conditions. Um, I want peace, but as long as my side wins. Politically, religiously, societally. Um, most people think that peace can only be truly attained through the, the uh, instrumentation and the realization of their own political or religious ideals. But that dream of a very specific peace is, a, is exactly what creates war, conflict, pain, and disillusion with any movement or government or religion. Peace by condition is what everybody wants, but it cannot be achieved. Now, peace by compromise. The word compromise, nobody likes that. But it's usually what people do in life in general. I'm not even talking about ideas at this point. Um, let's go back decades. Soviet Russia. There's a lot of ideas about um, freeing the proletariat. Uh united labor to uh, that's owned by the workers and the withering away of the estate eventually once everybody is together and cooperating then the state will wither away and there will be uh there'll be a level of freedom that humanity has never seen it's the idea soviet russia not just Soviet Russia, but I'm using that as an example. And we're using, you know, the example of about 30, no, no not 30, about 40 years ago. But when you try to shove, keep in mind that I, I'm not, I'm definitely not a capitalist either, but I'm using this as an example. When you try to shove people into ideas, uh, when you try to make a perfect world and you try to shove people into lanes that are that you try that the people on the top try to define um, it never works out to being humanly possible and human beings everybody on top has these ideas and then the average person has to try to just make a basic living, try to provide for their family, try to allow for some, try, try to work towards some semblance of harmony. Um, not necessarily because of the ideas of a government or a political ideal or even a religious ideal, but usually in spite of it. And the people on the bottom who don't really have a voice Always, you know, just try to find a way to make everything work. Um, this is true in capitalism as well. Not just communism. Um, also not just one religion. And, you know, Muslims, Christians, Jews, Hindus. All the decisions that are made on the top... Everybody underneath is like, okay, well, we have to try to figure out a way to make this realistic. How can we make all of these things that are being told to us and that are forcing us into a certain lane, how do we make that realistic for our family? How do we, you know, make things work? And it's remarkable because the people on the bottom and even most of the middle, um, that's what I'm talking about. Uh, in that general direct, in that general range, they figure out how to make things work, but it's in spite of the grander ideas, not because of them. 
And the funny thing is, I wish that it was because of the grander ideals, but it's really because of just, just practicality, reality. Now, I'm a very liberal, liberal person. Um, I, uh, I'm a democratic socialist. But at the same time, I also see that no matter, you know, those are my grander ideals. But on the ground level, you know, democratic socialism is never, it, it's not a reality in the United States. I wish it would be. But even if those wishes, those wishes are incorrect or perhaps non-feasible, then despite that, we see that everybody on the ground level, they're just trying to get food, water, freedom, prosperity. And the reason why I went kind of into this spiel is because I was watching The Expanse. And the most recent episode was uh, this belter. It's, God, it's really hard to describe The Expanse. Um, but Mars and the Earth uh, exploit the belters, who are the ones who gather the water from asteroids in space. And the belters have always been exploited. But uh, there's this old man who has his cat that he calls the Lucky Earther. <laughs> Pretty good. And uh, he's... You know, right before this bomb explodes that's planted by a terrorist group, uh, a Belcher terrorist group, don't get me wrong, the Mars and Earth has treated the Belchers like crap in this, you know, sci-fi universe that is The Expanse. Really good books. You should look them up. But what made me start to really consider, well, I've been considering this, but what made me think about it in, in a different way and maybe that my highest ideals are not, you know, not necessarily not realistic, but that, you know, what it made me think of like people on the ground making things work with what they have and what they're told, despite those above telling them, you know, the uh, restrictions or the um, or the political fabric or the resource oriented fabric um, but there's this uh, this old man that's on a space station and he very poor and he has this cat and he calls a, you know a you know lucky earther and uh, he explains that the reason why he calls this cat that is because <clears throat> all he wants and all he wants for his children is water, food, air, and freedom. And that for an earther, somebody from earth or that you know lives on earth, um, all that is granted. Uh, so that's why he calls his cat Lucky Earther because he cares about his cat so much <clears throat> that he provides all those things and he works to provide those things for his cat and and his children, but <laughs> he can't call his children Lucky Earthers uh, uh, because um, water is not a guarantee for him. Air is not a guarantee for him. Um, food isn't a guarantee for him and most definitely freedom is not a guarantee for him but a cat has a smaller world a human being has a little bit bigger of a world and <clears throat> what he says next is what really made me start to think um, you know everybody who you know there are two kinds of people, is what he says. The people that want more hate and the people that just want water, air, and freedom. 
there's just two kinds of people. Now, it may seem like a really weird dichotomy in that it doesn't, it, it doesn't make sense in every situation, but at the same time, it made me think that, you know, a lot of people on the bottom are slaving away and just want the basics for themselves and their family. While all the people on the top are the ones who want to fight for more power. And it, it struck me for some reason. Well, not for some reason, it struck me for obvious reasons. If you're a human being, it would strike you. Um, if you start to consider the same things, but regardless, uh, but peace and destruction. There's a lot of people who talk about cleansing fires. There's a lot of people who talk about what it takes to, uh, make a more pure way of being, pure existence. Uh, there's even a lot of left-hand pathers who say, you know, uh, Baal is like a cleansing fire. Satan is like a cleansing fire. Um, you know, you hate the forest fire, but it gives rise to fertilizer and new life. True. Destruction does leave way for something else to grow, especially if it's, you know, proper destruction. A destruction of thing or destruction in ways and of things that will leave fertile ground in a variety of ways. At the same time, we should not be someone who does the destruction because we want this to happen. Destruction should be, it should be something that happens, not something that's that's enforced, um, initiated, embraced. Destruction will happen. You don't need to do it. You don't need to be the one who decides you are an agent of destruction in order to bring about what you think you need to bring about. But that's kind of how it works, isn't it? Because those who want a different system also think that they are the cleansing fire. The cleansing fire will exist by itself. Don't be the one who destroys. Don't do it. Be the one who tries to preserve for as long as possible. Because you take the mantle of destroyer, expect to be destroyed. There's an old saying among Hindus, when Dharma is protected, it protects. When it is destroyed, it destroys. If you, destroy, if you decide to be a destroyer, to bring about more fertile ground or a better future, uh, better future, understand that you yourself will be destroyed. And don't be mad about it. Don't be sad about it. And don't expect anything else. It is far better to preserve. But if you are a true ideologue and you want to be a part of some kind of force of destruction, just understand that the villain is necessary but the villain gets the villain's punishment. And don't be mad about that either. Peace. Peace. <laughs> the funny thing about peace is that it's best to sit back and observe 
unless innocents are being directly killed. Literally. Um, but if you want your conditional peace, and the peace that you want to accept is the peace of your political or religious ideology, and you think that only through that way is the peace that can preserve humanity, you need to rethink the situation. And if you think that you being the destruction that could bring about more f fertile ground for humanity to exist or more f fertile ground for the freedom that you imagine, you need to reconsider. Look at things as they are. Look at the people at the bottom. Do they need this? Do they want this? And what will it do to them? All of them. Not just the ones that support you. Not just the ones that love you. Peace and destruction. They both need to be considered carefully. And please consider them carefully. At any rate, thank you very much for watching. I hope this is <laughs> this rant about peace and destruction um has been informative if it hasn't that's okay too if you have any questions comments concerns shoot them down in the comment section below on youtube at any rate thank you very much for watching and hope all of you have a wonderful day